Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and a privilege. Um, I want to thank Jackie for making this all possible and inviting us. It's, thank you. Um, Tom McIntyre and the whole crew at NYU who are behind the scenes making this all happen. Um, and so many other people, um, including uh, people who work at the Maxine Green High School, um, uh, Jeffrey Ellis Lee in particular, and you, one of the students who will be performing tonight uh, is from a program that's been a collaboration with Lincoln Center uh, and Maxine Green High School that, that those of us in Voices have been really proud to be part of for the last four years. Uh, what you're gonna see tonight is a showcase, um, just a, a little sample of a performance that was created by the historian Howard Zinn. Uh, and it grew out of uh, Howard's own appreciation of theater. Uh, Howard wrote three plays. Uh, he also uh, spent uh, a, a life appreciating how music and art informed social change. Uh, he himself tells the story of how it was actually listening to Woody Guthrie sing songs of American labor history that he realized the history that he had not been learning in his education, in, in his school textbooks, in his formal training as a historian. And that taught him a very important lesson. And when he came to write A People's History of the United States in 1980, people really uh, obviously came to resonate with that book and it came to have such a profound influence in our culture. And what Howard found is that the thing that people most uh, connected with in the book was not his interpretation of history, but was discovering the voices of change makers who had been written out of the culture and out of the history books and out of the mainstream narratives. Um, and so the beginning of this project, Voices of a People's History of the United States, was gathering together those voices, uh, putting them together in a book, and then having people like the very talented performers who are here tonight bring them to stage. So I am very privileged to welcome, and I hope you will join me in welcoming, uh, our readers and performers tonight, Wallace Shawn, Martha Redbone, Sean Therese, and Stacey Ann Chin. And I'm gonna see if this is on. Yes, it is. So we begin tonight's program with the words of Howard Zinn himself from a debate that took place in 1970. And the, the story behind this is, uh, I'll briefly tell, is that Howard was protesting the Vietnam War and was in fact um, engaged in draft resistance. Uh, and he was summoned to court. But the day he was summoned to court, he was also invited to go participate in a debate on civil disobedience in John, at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He chose to go and participate in the debate rather than go to court that day. I start from the supposition that the world is topsy-turvy, that things are all wrong, that the wrong people are in jail and the wrong people are out of jail, that the wrong people are in power and the wrong people are out of power, that the wealth is distributed in this country and the world in such a way as not simply to require small reform, but to require a drastic reallocation of wealth. I start from the supposition that we don't have to say too much about this because all we have to do is think about the state of the world today and realize that things are all upside down. Daniel Berrigan is in jail, a Catholic priest, a poet who opposes the war, and J. Edgar Hoover is free, you see. <laughs> At Kent State University, four students were killed by the National Guard, and students were indicted. So we have to start from that supposition that things are really topsy-turvy. And our topic is topsy-turvy, civil disobedience. As soon as you say the topic is civil disobedience, 
you're saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war. And millions have been killed because of this obedience. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. That's why we're always surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another, no matter what they say. What we are trying to do, I assume, is really to get back to the principles and aims and spirit of the Declaration of Independence. This spirit is resistance to illegitimate authority and to forces that deprive people of their life and liberty and right to pursue happiness. And therefore, under these conditions, it urges the right to alter or abolish their current form of government. And the stress had been on abolish. But to establish the principles of the Declaration of Independence, we are going to need to go outside the law. My hope is that this kind of spirit will take place not just in this country, but in other countries, because they all need it. People in all countries need the spirit of disobedience to the state. And we need a kind of declaration of interdependence among people in all countries of the world who are striving for the same thing. In 1964, in part inspired by the work of Bob Dylan, but also reacting to his own experiences facing racism and discrimination, the singer and songwriter Sam Cooke wrote a song that would become an anthem of the civil rights struggle. Good evening. I was born by the river in a little tent just like that river I've been running ever since it's been a long time coming but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it is. It's been too hard to live in, but I'm afraid to die. But I might not be if I knew what was up there beyond the sky. It's been a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movies and I go downtown. Folks keep telling me, don't be hanging around. It's been a long time coming. But I know it's going to come. Oh, yes, it will. 
And I go, I go to my brother, and I say, brother, can you help me, please? And he looked at me, and he said, I like to, but I'm unable. And then I looked around, and I was right back down on bending knees, yeah. That I might not last for long. But today, right now, I think I'm able to carry on. It's been a long time coming. But I know, I know. A change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Vito Russo delivered the words that you're going to hear next in 1988 only blocks from here as part of the organizing that was foundational to the movement to confront the AIDS crisis and led to the formation of ACT UP. You know, for the last three years since I was diagnosed, my family thinks two things about my situation. One, they think I'm going to die. And two, they think that my government is doing absolutely everything in their power to stop that. And they're wrong, on both counts. So if I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from homophobia. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from racism. If I'm dying from anything, it's from indifference and red tape because these are the things preventing an end to this crisis. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from the fact that not enough rich, white, heterosexual men have gotten AIDS for anybody to give a shit. Living with AIDS and it's like living through a war which is happening only for, only for those people who happen to be in the trenches. Every time a shell explodes, you look around you and you discover that you've lost more of your friends, but nobody else notices. It isn't happening to them. They're walking through the streets as if we weren't living through some sort of nightmare. And only you can hear the screams of people who are dying and their cries for help. No one else seems to be noticing. It's not happening to us in the United States. It's happening to them, to the disposable populations of fags and junkies who deserve what they get. The media tells them that they don't have to care because the people who really matter are not in danger. They watch it on the news and they have dinner and they go to bed because it isn't happening to them and they don't give a shit. And they don't spend their waking hours going from hospital room to hospital room and watching the people that they love die slowly of neglect and bigotry. They haven't been to two funerals a week for the last three or four or five years, so they don't give a shit because it's not happening to them. Why are we here today? We're here because it is happening to us and we do give a shit. Someday, the AIDS crisis will be over. Remember that. And when that day comes, there will be people alive on this earth, gay people and straight people, men and women, black and white, who will hear the story that once there was a terrible disease in this country and all over the world, and that a brave group of people stood up and fought, and in some cases, gave their lives so that other people might live and be free. So, I'm proud to be with my friends today because I think you're all heroes. And I'm glad to be part of this fight. We end with the words of the great poet, Marge Piercy.
What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up. They can bust you. They can break your fingers. They can burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover. They can do anything you can't blame them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone. You can fight. You can refuse. You can take what revenge you can. But they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. A snake dancing file can break a cordon. An army can meet an army. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand can have solidarity and your own newsletter. Ten thousand power and your own paper. Ten million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. And each day you mean one more. Please join me in thanking Wally, Sean, Martha, and Stacey Ann. And Anthony! <laughs>